Thank you for tuning in to our Sunday service for Bethlehem Temple Church of Albany, located at 2516D Dawson Road in the Largo Plaza. We pray that the word will be a blessing to your life. If you feel so led to sow, the ways to give are located on the screen. God bless you, and thank you again for tuning in. In John 17, um, in John 17, John 17, um, verse 13 through 15, then we'll go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 7. So in John 17, verse, 5, verse 13 through 15, it says, and now Jesus is in the midst of praying. Um, and so in verse 13, he says, and now come I to thee, he's talking to the Lord, and these things I speak in the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. I'm going to read verse 13 again. And now come I to thee and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Let's look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Man, I'm telling you, man, I felt good. I could have sang for another 20 minutes and, and went home. <laughs> That's wonderful, man. It's great worship. Great worship. Genesis chapter 4. Verse 3 through 7 it says, And in the process of time, uh, it came to pass that Cain brought up the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, in verse 4, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Uh, but unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Everybody say, countenance fell. Continence and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, seeing thy at the door, and unto thee shall be his desires, and thou shalt rule over him. All right? Amen. And so on this morning, I just want to talk to us for uh, not a long time about the spirit of joy, all right? Everybody say the spirit of joy. Spirit of joy. Spirit of joy. If, if everybody was close enough to somebody, I would say touch a neighbor and say you have the spirit of joy. But you're not that close to everybody, so it's okay. And so on this morning, I want to talk about the spirit of joy. We've been talking about um, Psalm 24, um, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall dwell in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. And of course, we've gone through uh, many scriptures. We've dealt with many different subject matters when it comes to cleaning the soul, uh, having a pure conscience, uh, going up the mountain. Uh, I began to see from God how he was trying to shed out of, out of our hearts and out of our spirit uh, this attitude that is dominating the earth, which is unbelief. And so when unbelief is dominating, then there are certain situations and certain issues and certain spirits that come into our life that we cannot get the victory over because there's too much unbelief in our system. And so God began to describe to the disciples when they asked them about why they ran into something in life that they could not conquer. And he said it's because you had to go into a level of prayer and fast. And of course, God began to teach us about uh, daily fasting and get into God's presence through fasting daily and through um, and through praying every day and so we begin to uh, give God our soul in the morning and we begin to give God uh, his time we be, 
instead of feeding in the world, we begin to feed on God in the morning. And I know that is a hard transition and even considered foolishness to the world to do a thing like that. But that's what we begin to do. And then at noonday, we begin to pray. And of course, some people can be here. Some people can be online. Other people cannot, which is no problem. The point is, is that as long as there is in your spirit, this willingness and attitude to pray and to call upon God in the time and uh, we begin to see things happen in the noonday. We begin to see things. People don't got jobs and other stuff don't took place in the noonday. Uh, and it's just been amazing. Uh, businesses been launched and all kind of things have taken place since we begin to do some certain things. Well, um, there is so much that's being uncovered because um, uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter five, the scriptures say that uh we don't want to lay again, I'm paraphrasing, we don't want to lay again the foundation of the principles of the faith, but we want to go on. And uh, what the devil seeks to do in Christianity is to keep leaders uh, stuck in a certain level of life so that the people can't go on. And so if the leader don't go on, then the people don't go on. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so then the leader has to go on because he has to be the example. He has to be the forerunner. He has to open up the path for the place where God want the congregation to go or the city to go or the family. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so then uh, in the midst of all of this, uh, God is just, you know, and every day I'm seeking him and every day I'm nervous and every day I'm like, Lord, where do we go next? Because it feels like, you know, it would be a little easier if I was just doing, you know, just regular church pastoral messages. But it's like I'm digging in territory and I'm uncovering things which is great, but at the same time, it's like, what makes sense? Where's the spirit blowing? Where's the spirit speaking right now? And so today I was in many areas, but what hit me the strongest was this spirit of joy. Everybody say spirit of joy. Spirit of joy. Uh, and, and see, of course, last week we, we, we began to deal with um, um, having covetedness uh, uh, versus um, um, we could be talking about keeping up with the Joneses, right? And I like that title. It's a good title. You know, I wish I had a nifty one this week. I'll try to ask Lord, give me something nifty. I ain't getting that. But anyway, so spirit and joy, you know, you know, whatever. And so, uh, but we begin to talk about covetedness versus, um, 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 what's the other word? Contentment. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yeah, yo. And so we begin to talk about covetousness versus contentment. We begin to talk about how in the beginning the devil tricked Adam and Eve, or Adam, Adam really wasn't tricked. He just did it willingly. Eve was tricked into going into this place of covetousness, this place where they assumed that they had the disadvantage, where they assumed that God had not taken care of them properly, and they begin to go outside of his borders to acquire things that was beyond where he wanted them to go, and then they ended up in a mess, and then Adam began to blame Eve, and really he was blaming God, and that's what we begin to say, that when you have a spirit of covetousness, you blame God for the place you are in life, for whatever you got going on, for whatever you got going wrong, and then, but what you're, when, once you're in a place of contentment, that's where you have a, you feel in your spirit and in your soul that you have the advantage. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. In my soul is where I must first gain the victory. See, whenever God delivers us, uh, if you look in the book of, let's look uh, in Romans chapter six. If you look in Romans chapter six, there is a sequence of deliverance uh, in the way that God expresses itself. So in Romans 66, it says, knowing this, that the um, old man was crucified with him, that is Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, I'm not going to teach on this, but what I'm doing is it's showing the sequence of deliverance. So the first thing that has to be done is what Jesus does in the spirit. And so Jesus crucified the old man. So Jesus has to crucify the old man. Why? Because until we're free, until we get to a place where we don't have that dominion over us that we could not get out of, we can never begin to work on the soul. See, there's no use of having soul work when I haven't had spirit work first. So I first must have spirit work. I first must get first delivered by Jesus. And then once I get delivered by Jesus, now I can go to Romans 12 and begin to renew the mind. Now, at the end of Romans 6 and 6, it begins to say that henceforth we should not serve sin. So, so there is a successful reality in the Christian life. How many people have ever felt like at some point in their Christian life that Go they ahead. could not Go overcome ahead. sin? 
Anybody ever feel like that? Because I know I have. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, Jesus, you know what? Ah, oh, no, you know what I'm saying? And you know, you almost got this feeling in your heart like, Lord, just come while we in church. You know what I mean? So I can be very sure that I'm going to make it. <laughs> because there are some days where the pressure is strong and I don't really believe I got the victory. You know what I'm saying? I may not have all the opportunity, but I'm just saying. So, you know, so, but there is a success in the way that God is setting up. So the first thing that happens is God deals with the spirit problem. And that's the problem that was too strong for us. That was the problem that, that came through, uh, through the devil having a certain level of right to us. And then Jesus paid the ransom through his blood and brought us back to a place where we can interact with God and be in the face of God. And then we can begin to deal with the soul. Now, it's necessary to deal with the soul because without the soul being dealt with, we cannot really enter into the presence of God. We cannot really go further into the things of God so that we can grow in God and really find the things we need to have. Now, one of the things that God has unleashed upon us when we get, uh, and, and it's just in addition to this free soul, to this soul mm, that is content, that requires nothing, it is, and, and Sister Jackson, I know that in the midst of it, I'm sure you're one of the ones, and I've been like, what is this feeling that I have? What is this peace that I have? What is this, uh, what is this that's over me? What is this, you know, I, last week I talked about how um, because there was such a way that we would go into worship, we were really fighting to get all the all the unbelief off of us so that we could actually get into the good presence of the Lord. So we were we, we, we spent most of our time because of how we fed our soul when we were coming to worship, we would have to get all that off of us so that we could actually enjoy God. Y'all know what I'm saying? But then once we have gotten into a certain exercise, now we don't have to fight anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's like you come in and you feel like you're there, right? And and this is what I'm saying. Because uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 4, uh, they were showing a picture of what the world was like when men lived in God's face. Now, they showed the opposite picture because they were showing uh, Cain's countenance falling because of the offering that he was giving, which really was coming from the soul that he had in the presence of God. And so it showed his countenance falling, but what is not revealing in the scripture, but Jesus revealed in John 17 was that Cain, was that while Cain was sad and angry and upset in the presence of God and could not get free and could not have this level of joy and great relationship with God, well, on the opposite side, Abel was full of joy. Watch this. We, we, most of the time when we think about joy, we don't understand that joy comes by relationship. Joy comes by relationship with God. Joy is not really something that just comes because you're saying, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, you're, you're rejoicing, and joy comes. Yes, that's great. Joy can arise in your heart. But what gets joy at a place where it is at this sustaining place where you can really pull from it at any time? Watch this. Where what the scripture said in Hebrews chapter 12, for the joy that was set before him. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so when it came to Jesus and the things that he was getting ready to do, there was a joy that was unremovable. You see, see, when we think about most of our interaction with God, we think about it from the sense of hopefully nothing goes wrong. You know what I'm saying? If nothing goes wrong, I'm going to have a good time with God. But God has given us through the Holy Spirit. And the second thing that is mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 after love is joy. Joy has been given to us not in doses on Sundays and not in moments where we're worshiping. But joy has been given to us as a attitude, as a spirit. And when, when Abel walked before the Lord, what really angered Cain was that Abel had all this joy. You know he had joy. And and I, now I'm going to give you all kind of scriptures with it because the kingdom of God is built off of not people visiting joy, but living with a spirit of joy. The scripture said that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace 
and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so I've been for many years been trying to figure out why it keeps saying joy like this. But joy is not a place to visit. Joy is something that gets set in your soul. Watch this. The same way that people can be given mess about the mean and it don't take them to set them off. That's how your joy works. See, when that joy in your spirit, Sister Jackson, see that joy, it don't take much to set it off. You can just, if it, God, you do, you know, God can just cross your mind. When I think of the, you see what I mean? It can just cross your mind and all of a sudden you feel something bubbling up. You feel tears begin to ready, get ready to come. And it's like, why am I always at this place where I feel like I'm broken before God? It's because there is a spirit that God has unleashed on upon us through when Jesus came back. One of the things that the world was missing is joy. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Is I feel that there's been too many depressed saints walking around us. I feel that, man. I feel that there's been too many people masking the depression before God. Their confidence is down. And, 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 and a part of the assignment today is to get that depression off of them by helping them to understand that God didn't just give you a dose of joy. He filled you with joy. Joy is supposed to be set before you in such a way that no matter what's right or what's wrong or what's positive or what's negative, it, you can go through anything rising and being strong. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so that's why I said, uh, look unto the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him. And then in James chapter 1, it says, count it all joy when you fall in a dive of temptation. Now, I don't know about anybody else. But when I go through something, joy is not the first thing I'm thinking about. But I'm telling y'all right now, there used to be a time, and the, and the best example I can use, of course, uh, is my son. Because, you know, in the public, that's one level. But at night, at home, that's a whole other level. And because, because of the diagnosis and the autism and stuff like that, you know, that thing used to mess with me. And I'm like, Lord, how can I be saved and in your presence, but, I, but my heart gets angry? mad and upset. You understand what I'm saying? And I have felt over the past few months, I felt a level of peace and joy begin to come that cannot be knocked off. You understand what I'm saying? It's like stuff happens and I don't respond the same. I know my wife and my kids have been looking at me different because they're like, wait a minute, he is not responding like he used to because stuff will happen and I will be set off. Stuff will happen and I will be ready to respond. But it's a sense of Everything is going to work out. It don't matter what I see. It don't matter what's going on. It don't matter what's happening. Watch this. What is going bad right now, I'm not crediting it to God. What is going evil right now, I'm not putting it on God's account. And many times that's what happens. Even Cain, even though he, he was messed up, even in his heart, he was blaming God for 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 the fact that God didn't accept his offer. He was blaming God for the fact that it seemed like Abel had a better life than him and Abel had respect that he couldn't get. And so and so there's a level of joy, I'm telling y'all, that is coming upon us and that is resting on us, that is never going to leave, that is going to be expressive. Watch this. Because the fruit of the Spirit uh, versus um, sim a simple emotion of joy, uh, a fruit grows. Everybody say fruit grows. fruit grows. See, fruit grows and so if joy is a fruit once it gets in your heart and the seeds get in your heart and begin to grow that means you can pick from them eat from the fruit at any time. Now, if it's simply an emotion, that means you can go in and out of it. That means that at certain points it's useful and other points it's not useful. But when it is a fruit, I can eat it all day long. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That's why Jesus would say stuff that was out Outrageous, like love your enemy and, 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 and bless those that curse you and pray for them that despite you because he was saying once this thing called love starts growing inside of you that it will become your only response y'all understand what I'm saying and so it's not that watch this it's not that your spirit can't love is that the soul has to be retrained to love it's not that your, your spirit can't have joy is that the soul must be retrained to live in joy this is what I tell you. See, 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 the reason why Cain ended up being removed from the presence of God is because he couldn't figure out how to live in joy. He was trying to be taught. He was trying to be trained by the Lord. But at the end of the day, 
he could not get it. Instead of him looking at the example before him, instead of him looking at God and hearing correction, he decided, you know the way I'm going to get joy? Kill Abel. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Think about Think about the, the distorted view of what joy we that the devil, the, the lie of joy, the lie of joy that the devil has put out in the world, where we seek people demise in order for us to feel good. Mm -hmm. Come on, y'all. Y'all know it's real. Yeah. <laughs> where it's like, man, you know, you just wait for something to go wrong, so you be like, good. See, that it should have happened to them. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Especially when they do something to you that you really want them to get it. Anybody ever want somebody to get it? Come on, tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I want plenty of people to get it. I had to repent the other day for on somebody kidding. <laughs> like in the name of Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> see, when you want somebody to get it, man, it, it's like, you see, watch this, watch this. When God is cleaning your soul, that's what'll happen. You'll just be spending time with God, and then he'll bring up something that's in your soul that's been lost. That he's like, let's get rid of that. Come on, let's repent of that. Come on, let's remove that out of the way. And in the midst of it, what'll begin to happen to you, y'all, listen. I'm telling y'all, saints are not used to the presence of God. Saints are not used to not visiting the presence of God, not feeling the presence of God in this earth, but the saints are not used to living in God's face. They're not used to it. But that's what God is setting us up to do. Live in his face. Why this? Live, that's what it says in Genesis. If you look in Genesis, and, and uh, if you look in Genesis around, uh, let's see here. Um, um, look at verse 14. And behold, Thou has driven out this day me. Oh, no, nah, that ain't what I want. Let me see here. Let's go up here a little higher because I'm looking for uh, the how how they were living, okay? So let's go to, uh, let's see here. Let's look at, mm, where am I looking? Let me just, let me keep going down here. All right, here we go. Um, let me look here. Where is it? It's here somewhere. Ain't nobody looking with me. Ain't nobody looking. Ain't nobody see it. No? No. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me find this thing. And uh, let's see. Okay, let's go back to verse 14, because it may have been there. All right. Behold, look, look, look what it says. Thou has driven me this day from the face of the earth. Everybody say face of the earth. Face of the earth. The face of the earth. Now, I want y'all to understand, man, when man fell, a part of man's falling was falling from the face of the earth. All right? Uh, a part of man's falling was falling from this place of the earth, which is the highest place where man would live. That's why God began to talk to us about the mountain. Because the face of the earth. Now, let's keep going in verse 14. And it says, from the face of the earth, and from thy face I shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Y'all see that? And so what was he saying? That before this time, I lived not only on the face of the earth, which is the place of the earth where God had dedicated, not just physically, but spiritually, where him and man would interact, but also from thy presence, from thy faith. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So not only was he leaving the face of the earth, he was leaving God's face. And what I'm trying to tell y'all is that God is bringing us back to living in his face. And what we're discovering, what we're going through and figuring out and finding out is what does his face look like? You understand what I'm saying? You, know, you ever glad at somebody? You really couldn't really tell. How do you get to tell what somebody's face looks like? You got to stare at it. See, there is a lifestyle of staring that produces a joy, produces the fruit of a joy that where it don't matter what's going on in your life, all I can see is God's face. It don't matter what's happening in the midst of, y'all understand what I'm saying? Now, what, now, here's the thing, right? Because I had a book that says Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and I didn't really like that book, but that book used to scare me, right? <laughs> and the question is, what does God's face look like? Now, uh, if you turn to Romans chapter five, verse one, um, there's a scripture there in Romans chapter 5 verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Everybody say a peaceful face. A peaceful 
Okay, now that is very important. Now, if you look up that word peace with God, therefore being justified by faith, this is Jesus's part. This is Jesus's part. We have peace with God, right? Okay, now what that means is, is that that word peace means to face, all right? Now, uh, I used to watch a movie called Bloodsport. Anybody ever seen that movie called Bloodsport? Any movie? Anybody ever seen a movie called Bloodsport? John Claude Van Damme? Oh, yes. Nobody ever seen it? Maybe, sort of. Anyway, any rate, in the movie, um, in the movie when they, they were doing combat and when someone would do something that they didn't like over on the other, in the, in the eastern side, the judges would turn their back. And turning their back meant that they did not respect. Remember how Cain's offering? God said he did not respect it, meaning he turned his back, right? And so, and so therefore being justified by faith, God who had his back turned is now facing us. That's what it means. All right? You understand what I'm saying? And so there is a place of facing God that we've now entered into. And what it's allowed us to do is to be able to come into this place of full joy. All right. Now, if you turn it on oh, John 17, as we're wrapping it up here, if you turn to John 17, you will read what was taking place. Listen, see, the same way Adam ruined everything, Jesus brought back the strength of everything. See, that's why I say the spirit of joy. It ain't just, it, it's an attitude, man. Look, it's an attitude that, that, that's supposed to fill you like a cup or a pitcher or a river or a well. And then you're supposed to be able to pass it to other people. You see what I mean? It's that joy, it becomes contagious. The scripture talks about it being joy unspeakable and full of glory, right? And so in John 17, uh, Jesus said, and while he was praying to God, he says, and now, in verse 13, and now come I to thee. So Jesus said, I'm getting ready to transition. I'm getting ready to come back to God. I'm getting ready to go back to heaven. And he says, and the things, and these things I speak in the world. Now it's important, oh God, Jesus. When you have joy, you're going to speak some things into the world that you would not speak with a thought, with a, with a, with a low countenance. That you will not speak when you're in despair. Come on, when you're in despair, you ain't going to say some stuff that you really need to say. Most people, when they're in despair, what do they do? Complain. But when you got joy, what you do? Prophesy. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So if God wants you to prophesy all the time, then he got to put you in a place where your soul is full of joy so you will always speak the words God wants you to speak. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So nothing in the world can bring down your spirit, bring down your continent, okay? And so in John 17, he says, and these things I speak in the world. My God, man, I just love it. That, and see, that's one thing I love about worship is once people begin to open up, then that's why I take the, the moment in that place where people open up to just start speaking stuff. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to speak anything. Anything in my spirit, I'm going to speak it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Now, um, that's a training as well, which means when we're in that place of worship and we begin to speak, just start saying anything, no matter. You, you understand what I'm saying? He said, let the weak say they're strong. You understand what I'm saying? That, well, when would you say that? With joy. You got to have joy to say you're strong when you feel weak. You got to have a level of overcoming within you. You understand what I'm saying? All right. So, so in these things I speak in the world. My God, I love that too. Because the world represents what? What is anti-God. The world represents what? What is anti, what is trying to help you get close to God. The what the world represents, the age that says that all that stuff you're saying about God ain't never going to work, ain't never going to come to pass. But I won't just speak to God. I will speak to my world. Y'all understand what I'm saying? My goodness, man. And so, uh, and these things I speak in the world, and the scripture said, that they might have my joy. Everybody say my joy. My joy fulfilled in them saying what Jesus is saying. He's saying, when I came to the earth, a part of my job was to bring joy back the way it was supposed to be from the beginning. When Adam and them fell, they didn't just fall into sin, they fell out of joy. They fell out of the joy of the Lord. They fell out of a place 
where joy was their only place that they walked in. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But when Jesus came back, he came back. The scripture said that in Hebrews chapter 1 or 2, that he was given the oil of joy above his brethren, that he was given a place of joy. It was an assurance, y'all. That's why whenever something would go wrong, he would be calm. That he owned the sea. The storm is raging. Peter them like, do you care? We about to die. He's like, we ain't about to die. Peace be still. Shut it down. How can you do that? Because the joy that sent me, what is the joy? That God got me. The only time Jesus did not have joy was when he began to take on the sins of the world. Y'all understand? Now you see why the devil want to keep you in sin or keep you soaking in sin or unbelief in your mind so that when it's time to have joy, it won't come out. My goodness, man. And so Jesus said that the joy that, uh, that he says, so in 17, he said, that they may have my joy. Everybody say, my joy. My see, joy. see, that's what I'm saying, y'all. See, whatever joy Jesus walked around with, that's what we got. Whatever joy Jesus had while he was on the earth and those three years where they really described what he had going on, that's the joy that we're able to walk in. Watch this. I got at least three years of joy straight, never breaking, never stopping, never shutting down. Can you imagine Jesus walking around full of joy three years straight? What he could do? My God, things were coming up. People had problems, headache, this, that, and that, and all he could do was laugh at it. He was so full of joy, nothing could disturb his spirit. Can you imagine having three? Come on, we, some of us can't even imagine having three hours of joy. <laughs> I'm talking about having three straight years of joy. Three straight years where it feels like at any moment I could really be, hey, watch this, I may be calm, but in my spirit, there's a full-fledged level of worship. I'm on my floor. I'm crying before the Lord. I have this openness and this ease because I have the spirit of joy. My goodness, man. Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so when Jesus came back, he brought back joy how it was supposed to be. And then his prayer was when I leave, give them the joy I had. My God. Give them the joy that you put inside of me. Whatever joy that you set before me that allowed me to endure the worst stuff that ever happened in my life, give that to them. And that's my prayer today. I pray. My God. I pray today. Mm. I know we're going through stuff. I know things are happening. I know that when you leave and you you're full of praise and full of and full of adoration and full of peace, that something goes wrong to try to throw you off. That there's bad news that come to you. But like Jesus said to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the synagogue leader, he said. Only believe, my God. And there is a level of joy that God wants us to stay in that it does not matter what we're dealing with. We can have the spirit of joy. My God, man. Not only just a contentment, but a joy. Not just a contentment and a joy, but a peace. It's, man, I mean, I got peace before I start praying. I got peace which drives me into a place of prayer. I got peace that says when I open my mouth, I can talk to the world. I can talk to whatever I'm dealing with because things got to change. They don't have a choice but to change. Somebody say they don't have a choice. Yeah. They don't have a choice, man. When I think about the stuff that's going on in my life, it don't have a choice but to change I have joy, my God. I don't have joy in church. I don't just have joy, my God, when I'm around other people that's praising. I don't just have the spirit of God when I'm around people that's prophesying. I got joy all by myself. The way God set up the Holy Ghost is so that everybody can have their own personal deposit of what Jesus was walking around on the earth with. Whatever Jesus restored and reconciled, I pray it come upon us. Come on, everybody lift your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, Jesus. With every hand lifted, Father, we pray that the spirit of joy begin to grow in our hearts like never before. Father, wherever we were weeping, wherever we were sad, wherever my God, our continents had failed, wherever there was disappointment, wherever there was a lack of faith and a lack of hope and a lack of trust, Father, I pray, my Kayatirimate, Rabbi, that you would let joy begin to grow and begin to flourish. My God, that the seed, my God, that the scripture said, my God, that it will fall on good ground, Lord, that there will be my God, a harvest of 30 and 60 and 100 for Father, I thank you, Lord, my God for joy dominating our prayers and our decisions.
nations, my God, and the things that we do and the way that we see you. We thank you, Lord, my God, for even the picture of seeing your face. We give your name the praise. Hallelujah. For the spirit of joy. My God, for the garment of heaviness, I thank you for the spirit of joy. My God, let joy build us in a way that nothing else could build us before. My God, let joy bring the kingdom out of us like nothing else before. My God, let joy bring life out of us like nothing before. Let joy, my God, be more than just an expression in a minute, but let it be a soul condition. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. Come on, come on. Let's just thank God. Thank you for joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for joy. Thank you. Thank you for the spirit of joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Things are changing. Things in my life are changing. Come on. Come on. Let's just begin to thank God for joy. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for joy. We thank you for joy. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Hallelujah, Lord. There's been things in our life. My God has made us sad and had us heavy. My God. But we thank you for joy. It is morning. It is morning. Somebody say joy coming in the morning, but it is morning. It is morning. It is morning. It is the night days are over. It is morning. The night time of life is over. It is morning. The night season of life was sin dominated has expired. It is morning. My God, Jesus is the morning light. Jesus is the light that came into the world. It is morning. My God, we thank you for joy. Thank you, thank you for joy coming down in us. I got coming up out of us. My God, dominating our mind and our spirit and our heart. My God, bringing scriptures to us that we've never even read before. Hi, yeah, yeah, opening the word unto us, opening your life unto us. We thank you for joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.